Thank you so much. Am I audible to all? Yes, you should be. Excellent. <laughs> so, first off, I would like to, to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, Lionel Larré, Christina Stanciu, uh, Matt Bukovoy, and uh, Oliver Scheiding, and of course, uh, the invaluable staff and students here who helped to keep everything up and running, uh, including the IT uh, side of things, which I know can sometimes be a bit of a struggle. I'd also like to express my heartfelt gratitude for being able to not only attend this wonderful conference, but to give a talk in front of such an esteemed audience and maybe even add to the discussions we have been engaging in over the last couple of days. For my talk today, I would like to shift your attention ever so slightly and focus on some select parts of the Native American press. We have, over the last couple of days, heard fascinating talks on the ICA, among others in regard to architecture, sovereignty, land, technology, law, history, education, and identity. And I would like to introduce periodicals into the discussion on the Indian Cit Citizenship Act at 100, specifically the Quarterly Journal of the Society of American Indians, later the American Indian Magazine, published 1913 to 1920, Wasasha, uh, published 1916 to 22, and the follow-up publications by Joseph W. Latimer, uh, namely Bureaucracy a la Mode, published 1924 to 25, and Our Captives or Wards, the American Indian, um, a pamphlet published 1927 to 1932. These publications, as I will argue, give an insight into both the different perspectives on and the development of native viewpoints on the Indian Citizenship Act. These viewpoints can showcase resistance to dominant settler ideology in relation to US and tribal citizenship. Now, please indulge me while I give you the briefest of introduction to turn of the century Native American periodicals, <clears throat> because it must be pointed out that the number of periodicals, and by periodicals I mean newspapers, magazines, journals, pamphlets, journals, any <clears throat> print media with seriality and periodicity as their defining features, um, and is both vast and mostly unexplored for, for the Native American press side. And as Littlefield and Parens point out in their seminal three-volume compendium, Native American periodicals, and I quote, defy stereotyping as a category because they include not only those periodicals published and edited by Indians or Alaska Natives, but also those published by others, including the federal government, uh, which focus on the contemporary American Indian or Alaska Native and his affairs, end quote. Additionally, many archived sources are yet to be catalogued. During my own archival trips to the US, this was made abundantly clear to, clear to me when I was shown entire boxes filled with microfilm or microfiche, partly uncatalogued and partly mislabeled in, uh, and this is sort of important to point out, the largest uh, assemblage of Native American expressions in the world, uh, the Sequoia National Research Center, which have, have been incredibly kind to me while I was there. Um, <clears throat> in general, Native American periodicals offer a substantial archive of indigenous discourse, both by Native Americans themselves and by non-natives. For today, however, I will focus on an admittedly very few select entries from the SIAI's quarterly Montezuma's polemical pamphlet and the two follow-up publications. I will spare you uh, an introduction to the SAI's quarterly and Montezuma's Wasasha, since many of you uh, gentle listeners uh, are already quite familiar with them. After all, we've already heard a little bit about the SAI and some of its members, and Christina Stanciu's uh, The Makings and Unmakings of Americans features one of Wasasha's nameplates as the cover. I will, however, once we get to them, introduce you to Latimer's publications. Now, on to the main argument uh, I would like to introduce to you today. Um, to preface, views on citizenship for Native Americans, although the uh, Native American elites of the early 20th century were well, mostly, I guess, in favor of it, uh, emphasized different aspects of citizenship. Uh, let me give you some examples from the SAI's quarterly. And uh, let me just read out the quotes here. We want education, yes. We want to know all the educated Caucasian knows, but we want our self-respect while we are getting his knowledge. In short, let us discriminate between the goods and the bads of civilization, and the goods and the bad, uh, and bads of his own heritage. Weed out as many of the bads as we can, and send him along the way a finer type of citizen than if we turned him into a very average white man, just to have him white in culture. 
This is what I mean by recognizing the real values of truth, whether they are to be found in the in the pale face or the Indian, uh, as a quote by um, Laura Cornelius Kellogg, who we've been hearing about, uh, have, have heard about earlier. Next one. Christian citizenship is the highest type known. It is linked with the eternal. May it ever be the American ideal. Citizenship for the native ward is the aim of the United States, and he must ultimately assume the duties and responsibilities involved in a Christian nation. A quote here by Reverend Sherman Coolidge. And by the way, this and the uh, previous quotation were both from the um, first issue of the first volume of the um, quarterly. The government's aim to prepare the Aboriginal American for life and citizenship. The Indian then must understand, first, his duties as a citizen, second, his right as a citizen, and then he must be able to maintain these rights. His duties as a citizen includes a practical knowledge of his duties in the home, the school, town, country, city, state, and nation. Quote here by um, Emma Johnson Goulet, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. That is. Um, what I'd like to point out here is that the emphasis on education, Christianity, and government, uh, while certainly not uh, uh, an exhaustive representation here, um, nevertheless, these three quotes give an insight into the, the, the diverse viewpoint, uh, viewpoints of the SAI's members held regarding Native American citizenship in the early 1910s, uh, which were also circulated uh, among readers of its publication. They show both acceptance towards citizenship and, in the case of Kellogg's quote, resistance against the wholesale acceptance of imposed Euro-American values. This resistance, I argue, comes from an understanding of their rights or potential rights as US citizens and a desire to see heritage, that is Native American heritage, incorporated into an understanding of US American citizenship. And as Mishuana has pointed out, this is um, yeah, in part situated in opposition to the US American understanding that citizenship is about holding and amassing property, which is anti-indigenous. For Coolidge and Goulet, however, this notion doesn't really occur either through accepting and living according to the tenets of Christianity or by understanding a uh, uh, yeah, an understanding and accepting the duties of US American citizenship are Native Americans to become citizens. Note, please, that I did not include the second and third parts uh, Goulet mentions, namely the rights of these citizens and their ability to maintain them. And this is because she simply does not address them uh, in the rest of the article. Rather, she posits that the contact to whites in school and later on in everyday life is the only way Native Americans can adopt the ways of citizenship. And to reference uh, James Cox's talk, uh, these two conceptions of citizenship for Native Americans reveal an understanding of domestic subjects as a category within, but not of the settler nation. As such, we see, uh, at the very least implied, a self-understanding as the other, which is reciprocated by the settler state. Coolidge states that a, citizen, uh, that a Christian nation requires Christian, um, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Coolidge uh, states that a Christian nation requires Christian citizenship and consequently that a conversion to Christianity is a prerequisite for US American citizenship. Indigenous efforts to define their own citizenship and not have it defined for them by a white government body are negated in part by Native Americans who have internalized white settler structures into their thinking and being. This internalization is itself countered by Native American identities and tribal citizenships. Here, I would like to quote uh, Carlos Montezuma from a talk he gave in 1921 and from which I have borrowed the title of my talk. Quote, I look like an Indian because I am one of the race which has carried the name since the time of the landing of Columbus. In other words, I look the part and you cannot think of me otherwise. In fact, if you can, I am willing to give you a chance after the lecture is over to look at me as a pale face only with your mind free of the word Indian. <laughs> now, Montezuma himself is to be polite, a uh, somewhat challenging figure in Native American and Indigenous studies. 
Um, his embracement of Native American assimilation into the settler state alongside his lasting friendship with uh, Richard Henry Pratt, the infamous superintendent of the Carlisle Indian and Industrial School, have greatly diminished uh, his activist efforts which ultimately enabled the Yavapai to remain on what was left of their ancestral lands instead of complete displacement. The point Montezuma is making here is one of white settler romanticization of Native Americans. He somewhat loftily recalls the time of the landing of Columbus and points out that the Native Americans or Indians got their names from the settlers instead of the other way around, i.e. the Native Americans tell the settlers who they are and how to be called. You cannot think of me otherwise, he says, and with it points out one of the long lasting ways of settler colonial ideology thinking and categorizing along racial lines to the point they are unable to see anything else but the other. At the same time, Montezuma resists the dominant ideology. He fights against the injustices he sees. So, following this logic, one sort of must assume that citizenship for Native Americans would not make them true American, uh, in, in, in reference to what uh, Angel showed us in her engaging talk, but at best second-class Indian citizens. In his polemical newsletter, Wasasha, Montezuma gave scathing speeches on the failings of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as well as the SAI, who, to his mind, were more concerned with talking about than acting in defense for their people. I quote from the very first issue. Wasasha appears in its tone as though it is very disloyal to the United States government and very unappreciative of turning on the Indian Bureau when the Indian Bureau, quote, has done everything for the Indians. For 40 years, the writer has been silent. He is a man and a citizen. He would be unworthy of his country were he to remain dumb and do nothing when he sees his country is going wrong by keeping up the Indian Bureau that is crushing the very life out of his race. Self-management of their own affairs, land and resources um, is the primary issue or are the primary issues for Montezuma. And I would like to point out that Montezuma advocated for what many in the settler state saw as their God-given right as inhabitants of the US. He continued to publish his newsletter until his failing health, a combination of diabetes and tuberculosis, um, which forced him to fold his paper in 1922, uh, a year before he died. During the latter years of his life, from probably about 1911 onwards, Montezuma worked together with Joseph W. Latimer, an attorney who practiced law in Cleveland, San Francisco, and New York, um, and they worked together on a legal case against the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as one might suspect even. But um, prior to this, the two had become friends, and Latimer shared many, if not all, of Montezuma's sentiments in regards to the Bureau. After Montezuma died in 1923, Latimer decided to pick up where Montezuma had left and published a series of pamphlets and a newsletter centered around Native American rights and the shared distaste he had with Montezuma for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. One of these pamphlets is Bureaucracy a la Mode, which ran from 1924 to 1925. <coughs> The motto of the four-page paper is taken from Montezuma's 1915 speech, Let My People Go, and with it, Latimer firmly places this and other publications as successors to Wasasha. Here, I would like to point out that Latimer did not, um, <coughs> see him, uh, uh, did not pretend to be Native American. At least as far as I can tell, he understood himself as an ally to Native Americans and fought Pardon me, and fought for their rights, uh, and his publications are very clear as to who the originator of his political ideas was and whose legacy he aims to continue. He is mimicking the scathing prose against the Bureau, however, always with a clear reference to his friend Montezuma on the front page. Let me quote to you from the first page of Bureaucracy Alamo's third issue, um, published on, in June 25, 1924, just weeks after the passing of the Indian Citizenship Act. Quote, it remains to be seen whether this law is quite as definite in its effect as the Times, and here he's referencing the New York Times, assumes it to be. Um, this first entry uh, of the issue reprints, reprints the ICA, two articles on the top topic published in different newspapers, and also comments by, uh, on it by Latimer. So sort of a quite an interesting text here or an uh, assemblage of different uh, publications, uh, both periodical and legal, as well as a known uh, editorial comment here. Um, at any rate, uh, he continues, the bill does not consider the new status of the Indian as inconsistent with wardship, that is to say, group wardship. 
This fact would seem to differentiate the Indian's new status from that of the alien, and here please pay attention to the term. Um, we have never put aliens collectively or as a group under the wardship of the nation or any state of the nation prior to naturalization. He goes on to point out that the handling of Indian affairs would shift from federal to state level through a, quote, gradual process, a uh, process, a phrase with an ominous sound often heard from the Bureau. Now, jumping ahead another two years uh, now, um, we're in 1927, um, the first issue of Our Captives Awards the American Indian has a headline demanding equal rights and treatments for Native Americans. Release the American Indian from captivity with the subtitle reading, Give our Indian, citizenship, uh, Indians, uh, Indian citizens the personal rights and freedom possessed by all citizens. So right off the bat, he sort of was very, very strong in his um, yeah, advocacy for equal rights as citizens for all, independent of race. In the third issue, Lat Latimer published an appeal to uh, grant our Indian citizens freedom. The first framed article of the publication is set underneath two crossing American flags and opens with a quote from Abraham Lincoln's Pe uh, Peoria speech on uh, the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in October 1854. <clears throat> now, these three examples are quite clearly resisting the treatment of Native Americans in the US. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say that Latimer's publications showcases resistance to dominant settler ideology in relation to U.S. citizenship of Native Americans from a solely Native American perspective. However, Latimer's publications are sites of resistance, and they do continue the polemical resistance brought forward by Montezuma, which in turn finds its, well, I wouldn't say its origins, but uh, you can see uh, his thoughts being published by uh, the SII in its very early years. Thus, Latimer provided an outlet for Na Native Americans to voice their opinions, fostering political change through print activism for Native American citizenship rights, continuing the work of Montezuma and um, with it, the um, Society of American Indians. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.